I've always been going against the grain to bring these values into a traditional architecture practice. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard. Please join me today in welcoming Michelle Fenton, who is a past Business of Architecture client. She's a brilliant architect who specializes in crafting spaces that enhance happiness, well-being, and a sense of belonging. Michelle is committed to the idea that our environment significantly impacts our lives, drawing inspiration from diverse cultures and sustainability to create designs that foster comfort and joy. As the founder of Cora Architecture and Interiors and the host of the Happy Texture podcast, Michelle advocates for the inclusive human-centered design that transforms physical spaces into catalysts for personal fulfillment and community well-being. Michelle is based in Vancouver and resides in the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. She continues to inspire change in how we experience the spaces around us. This was a fascinating conversation. Always enjoy my topics with Michelle. She's an incredibly thoughtful and forward-thinking architect. And some of the things that we discussed was Cora's innovative business model and how they have moved away from traditional architectural services and have invented new forms of consulting and strategic visioneering packages. We talked about different ways to um, help curate and direct clients' vision and how you can do that as an architect. And we also spoke about the high-level visioneering and strategic skill sets that the architect has that can be applied to our clients' business agendas and their own ideas for where their organizations are want to be going. And we also talk about other things such as B Corp um, certification uh, and the importance of making sure that you're running a business in alignment with your values. So loads of gold here. Sit back, relax and enjoy Michelle Fenton. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Michelle, what a pleasure to have this conversation with you on the podcast. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great, Ryan. Thank you. Likewise, it's great to see you. I know it's very early there and I appreciate you making the effort to come on the show. And obviously, we've known each other for a, a long time and yes. we've had many conversations about your, your business. You're the founder of Cora Architecture and Interiors, um, really I know that you kind of go by the moniker of being placemakers. Yes. And I think or some we of like the... to. Or we like to. Uh, but, and, it's a, and it's a really inspiring business model that you guys have, socially driven. Um, I know you guys recently have become B Corp certified, which is no easy thing to accomplish and really does kind of demarcate you as being people uh, or a firm that really walks the talk, if you like, and kind of demonstrates the kind of values that you stand for. Um, your work moves into various sectors, green energy, education, working with indigenous peoples and, and land. Um, very interesting and fascinating um, kind of client base that you have. And also we'll talk a little bit more about the, the, the business model that you've adopted. Um, but, but perhaps we can just talk We'll, we'll start the conversation by, well, what does Cora mean? Mm. Uh, well, Cora is, uh, came from a Greek word um, which uh, symbolized the chorus at a play, a tragedy specifically. 
And the purpose of the chorus at the, in the tragedy was to offer the audience a cathartic effect when things get really tense and and, mm-hmm. and, and, and sad. And so I thought, what, what a great name for <laughs> an organization that also wants to create a space for that cathartic healing kind of effect. And honestly, it just came to me. Um, I wasn't in search of it. I was in search of a name and it just popped into my um, awareness and it just, everything just moved from there. I had done a thesis in, in, in university uh, and studied the idea of Cora. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think there was a, there's a bit of a thought uh, marinating in the back of my mind all of those years. And when I, when I thought about fund, funding Cora architecture and interiors, the word just, it just made sense. Love it. Yeah. And how long have you guys been going for? Um, this will be our sixth year as Cora. Um, I was formerly a partner and founder of Studio B Architects before that and Groundswell Architects before that yet. Mm-hmm. But Cora feels like the the real me, <laughs> you know, you go through these evolutions and Cora feels like we've hit on something that's really profound and really meaningful. And, and what was the, the impetus for setting up this, this firm? Like if you were already in a, you know, kind of strong, high positions in other organizations, that's quite a, that's quite a departure or quite a, a, yeah. a career shift or a difficult decision anyway. It was difficult because, um, you know, my whole education, my whole career, you're taught to be, quote unquote, an architect and whatever that means. You have a firm, you do buildings, you do that sort of thing. But at a certain point, you have to, well, a certain like personal point in my life, I came to um, a moment where I had to have a self check in and realized that that wasn't the path that made me happy. That wasn't the path that I was most joyful. I love design and I love being an architect and building buildings, but um, it wasn't really something I was passionate about anymore. It wasn't really something that really brought me a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you get to a certain age in life and these things become part of the journey to rethink and to reimagine yourself and think, oh, like, what what do I want to leave behind? Um, in the end, and a building wasn't enough. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, buildings weren't enough. I wanted to leave more. So, yeah. and and um, you were active in education previously, right? Or you still are? Uh, I used yes, I I did. Um, oh, we're going. You, I can talk a whole lot about that. The uh, education of architects, but um, yes, I did teach for a short stint at my alma mater, uh, University of Waterloo. Mm -hmm. studio there Uh, so and I've always been really um I always think education is such a powerful tool not just to teach you how to you know uh contribute to society but Mm -hmm. more importantly how to how to really take control of your life how to really rethink your purpose and what the gifts you have and how you can put that to use so the opportunity to teach young architects was really really wonderful it opened up a whole other group of ideas for me, which maybe in, there's another career there. Who knows? But I'd love to see architects get taught differently. Well, I I think it's interesting as well because in your practice, there is, you know, you can tell that there's an interest in the function of the architect and yes. what architects do and how they can contribute in different intelligent ways. I mean, just before um, we hit record, we were both talking about you know, whilst the the things we might do on a daily basis might not be your traditional buildings, it's still architecture. Absolutely. Yes. And and there's a kind of difference between the 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 practice of architecture in terms of its professional sense of construction science and codes and knowledge, and then the discipline or the thinking like an architect. Yes. Which is actually yeah. really, really useful and much more broadly applied and also has an incredible amount of um, possibility in terms of of business. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about the influence of education and the pedagogy of an architect on your practice on Ancora and and kind of use that to illustrate how you've moved away from traditional architectural services. 
Yeah. Um, well, I mean, perhaps different schools teach differently, but the school I went to was, I mean, to be fair, it was very focused on the practice of architecture. We had a very robust co-op um, uh, co program, which really encouraged students to go out and work in, in, the, um, in the field. Um, but it also had a really huge focus on cultural history. And I think that the two of those together have had a really important impact on me because I saw the role of the architect in the traditional way. Yes, you had to build a building. Yes, you had to know building science and code and typology. Um, but what I, what I really thought was interesting was the cultural impact on a building, the cultural impact on those typologies and the, hum the humanity of a building, the humanity of the built environment. Um, and so I, yes, I did the technical stuff um, as you have to do, uh, but I was really, that that whole humanity, the impact of it, why build a building and who are you building a building for really disturbed me in the <laughs> Buddhist sense, <laughs> <laughs> caused disturbance. Um, and as you know, uh, disturbance is a good thing um, or yeah. can be a good thing. And so you go on a quest, you get disturbed and you go on a quest, right? Yeah. And, um, and the quest led me to Cora. The quest led me to rethink what not just traditional architecture can be or how to expand that idea of a traditional architect, but more importantly, the role of the architect in society, mm -hmm. in, in creating something for everyone. Um, my focus particularly is on happiness. Uh, mm -hmm. And so where, where I landed with this intersection of technology and science and the humanity of it was, um, I, I saw this great quote and I had done a, a really interesting talk on happiness. Uh, the Dalai Lama believes that it is our, it is our right to be happy. It is mm -hmm. our birthright to be happy. And so I thought, well, why not? Why not pursue that? Why not take that disturbance and, and try to see where it leads? And so Cora was formed with this idea that um, we've got the technical chops. Why don't we use that and apply that mm -hmm. to see if we can build into the built environment, happiness, inclusion, uh, belonging. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the journey started. <laughs> it's so, so been that, still ongoing, but well, um, it's been it's been a joyful journey. But that that's very it's a very kind of um, quite profound actually, like vision for what architecture can do and its and its power, um, and quite reflective in making sure that that's you know, that's the function of what it, all the projects that we're doing. Why did it? Why did that start to influence you in the sense of? not doing traditional buildings, but then broadening the conversation into say what, what we call placemaking. Yeah. Oh. Well, the placemaking was always there in the buildings, but what I realized is that a, I was getting older and mm -hmm. there's not that many years left and how could I have the biggest impact? And when I thought about how long it took to do a building, I didn't have many buildings left in, in my future. So I thought, well, what if I took a zoom out and instead of building one building, I influenced all the buildings. Um, I, had, I had the ability to um, bring to the awareness of the architecture practice, this way of thinking about architecture, this, this sort of a more strategic objective, a strategic lens on architecture and how we design and how we build. And so I thought about it in, from that very pragmatic sense, to be honest, and figured, well, with the years I have left, the, the best use, highest best use of my time is to create a practice, create a rigor that looks at architecture from a high strategic level mm -hmm. um, and create design standards and design typologies that impact the built environment because I could keep doing one building at a time and it's just not enough time. You yeah. Know? So that's, it was very pragmatic. Uh, it's, and, it's, but, it's, kind, it's kind of more impactful in a way. Yes. Yeah. Cause you're, you're, you're kind of setting up, you're influencing and setting up the parameters for architecture to be facilitated within. 
Yes. And it kind of, you know, you're getting those right, then it's going to be beneficial to a kind of wider audience and there's a bit more correct more longevity to it if you like yeah yes and you use the word facilitated and I really like that word because part of what's really important um and I hope I hope uh, we are able to to articulate it really clearly is that we are we are not taking uh, my idea of architecture Mm -hmm. we really we think it's really important to take our idea of what we need and to build the foundation of the built environment from that and so what I mean by that, a huge part of our practice is community engagement and stakeholder engagement. Um, and to, to design standards of building um, and, and that are appropriate to the communities that we're building within and building for. And so I think that this is the approach that I think does distinguish uh, the role of the architect in a way. And, and we flip the script a little bit where the, um, what do you call it, the preliminary sketch, the preliminary uh, vision of the building does not come from the architect, it comes from community. Mm -hmm. So that gives me a great amount of joy, even just saying that, you know, I I think, um, wouldn't it be nice if we built buildings for people? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So in the true sense, in the true sense of the word, you know, um, I think most architects, desire to build buildings for people, but the way we're traditionally, the way we traditionally practice, the burden of um, ideation comes from the architect Mm -hmm. and, and, and comes through our lived experience. And so I I just wanted to reiterate that, um, that lived experience is a singular voice. And Mm -hmm. I I think it's time to think about that lived experience as a, a chorus in a way going back to the core core I don't know was that Love okay that, you know <laughs> <laughs> well, well it well it's it's very um it's quite a, a poetic way of, of thinking about it and really what we're starting to lean into here was a conversation about agency and mm. being able to give people a voice in shaping their environment and the built environment absolutely uh, and being a being a bridge to that and we live in an interesting time now where um you know whilst we have still have the the traditional human organizations of cities and countries there are now businesses and old institutions that almost operate like kind of mini countries or regions within themselves that are massively impactful and you have people who never leave them for example you know who can be in those kinds of um communities or facilities for for a long period of time when you're talking about community engagement and stakeholder engagement what does that look like on a kind of day-to-day real basis with the sorts of clients that you're working with and perhaps you can give us an example of the kinds of clients that you work with and and what is the what's the dialogue that you're kind of encouraging yes well i mean you you listed a diverse group of clients at the top of this uh chat and and the when you when you put the clients into those boxes they it does seem diverse Mm -hmm. but what the common thread is um throughout all of our clients is the search for belonging the search for for being well being healed um, uh, and having that sort of a, an approach that, you know, I, I, I heard the other day of this great exercise where a community building exercise where everyone gets into a circle, shoulder to shoulder, kids, older people, and everyone sits down at the same time. And even though like a, a giant man is being held up by a child and <laughs> think about that for a minute. Right? And they're all sitting on each other's knees. They're sitting on each other's knees, but because they're sitting together, shoulder to shoulder, standing shoulder to shoulder, and sitting together, everyone is, stands up, regardless of their ability, regardless of their strength, regardless of their mm-hmm. size. That is what community engagement brings. It's mm-hmm. for everyone to be able, to, at the beginning of a project, we're not even talking about design, is to see how their experience, their life, is critical to the outcome in the end. Um, and so it is It is about building belonging and building that uh, sense of 
you're going to be held. You're going to be held by the community. Mm -hmm. You're going to be held by the project. You'll see yourself in it in some small way or some big way, but at least in some way. Um, and so that's the analogy of, I love that, that, that story about the, the, um, the community building exercise, because I think that's what we're trying to do or what we're mm -hmm. doing is that we're, we're taking out the, um, we're, we're taking out that expectation that one person brings, brings the solution. Um, we, we are, we're trying to, um, establish a collective wisdom that helps form not just a, a, a sense of community, but the building in the end or the, the landscape in the end or the campus plan in the end. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we have communities that are indigenous communities. We have university clients, we have workplace clients. Um, we have community clients who are, um, marginalized that we're trying to bring in to understand how their experience is as rich and beautiful as anyone else's, mm -hmm. but it all comes down to that image of everyone sitting down together and being held in that space mm -hmm. um, and being held by the project in the end. Um, it well, doesn't, it doesn't nullify the fact that I'm an architect and I have technical and code responsibilities sure. and I say the responsibilities. That's my contribution. When I sit down, I'm being held, but what I am holding, I hold that responsibility of the technical aspect of it. Um, but I am not sitting down by myself in the middle of the circle. I'm part of that circle. Well, how does a client know or assess when they are ready to engage with this kind of conversation? What kinds of things might they be dealing with that would be a trigger point, if you like, mm -hmm. to, to call into Cora or how do, how do they find out about you and what it is that you're providing? Well, that's really interesting. And perhaps I could do a better job at marketing. But what happens is that clients come to us and say, we need an architect to solve this problem. Right. Um, and I say, well, tell me more about the problem. Mm -hmm. And they are like, well, we need to put... Um, we need to put our seniors in a place because the community is really, uh, they're feeling really threatened. They're feeling really alone. And so we want to build a building and make sure that there's a good buffer of security around the building. And I say, okay, hang on a second, but is that going to solve this, the problem when the elders leave the building or come to the building? And so everyone's like, oh, well, and so the idea of solving the problem through a singular lens is start it starts the conversation and starts to open up the conversation and in that there's no single lens in how you solve a problem. Problems are systemic. Mm -hmm. Problems aren't let's build a building and it will be solved. Uh, we have to solve the the system that's imposing the issue, imposing the problem. And so that's how I see architecture. Right? I I see it as a series of systems. That mm -hmm. if something is broken in that system, or a few things are broken in that system, we have to address the system. The building alone is not going to solve the problem. The building is a resultant of looking at the system, looking at all of the systems and how they interplay, and the building becomes the demarcation of you uh, dealing with the systemic issue. So, so does this mean then that you become um, a kind of facilitator or an advisor to the client as they kind of build out their own building team, for example? Yes. Often, uh, often I would say we go backwards a little bit, which clients are very hesitant to do because I think it's important, again, when you when you work with indigenous communities, you learn this and you feel comfortable in that going back and re-examining in that slow way. When you work with um, capitalist um, and uh, more of a colonial structure, Western structure mm -hmm. client, it becomes very anxious for them to go back. Mm -hmm. But we are able to map out the progress of a project. That's interesting. You, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's it's. I mean, we learn so much from our clients. Every client is just a teaching moment for me anyways. Um, but the the ability to demonstrate that by going back and examining this, you are leaving, um, you're not only advancing the project and the project charter, but you're leaving um, the imprint of that work. 
makes everything in the future of that project and the future of your organization run more smoothly, more effectively, more efficiently. And some clients, those are words that doesn't matter to them, but a lot of our clients, effective operations, efficient operations Mm -hmm. um, become a really, that's, that's a, that's a key strategic indicator, a key performance indicator. So we're able to map that out and show them that going back a little bit or going back a lot um, does leapfrog you in a way um, to the things you want to do in the end. Because in the end, no one wants to build a building. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest. <laughs> People want to solve the problem. Yeah. They, think the, they think the building is the way to solve the problem, and sometimes it is. But mm-hmm. no one wants, no one says, hey, I have a problem, let's build a building. People are like, we have a problem. What can we do? Well, we have a piece of land. Maybe this building could help. By by addressing the problem, the building will serve you better because the building is there to, to solve the system, the problem you're having. The building's not there just, I mean, you put a monument up, sure. Yeah. That's a different kind of building. But mm-hmm. um, the building should solve your, your system, systemic problems. The building should solve your operational problems. Mm-hmm. The building should solve your community cohesion problems. Um, that's the job of the building. Mm-hmm. And so to not address the problem is just. Well, th- well this is really interesting <laughs> because it actually is facilitating a lot of value yes. for where the architect, architect can be contributing because so many times we see institutional clients They've had this. They've had a conversation about something to do with their physical assets, and it might just be brought down to a base level of, you know, of of kind of built and building maintenance, management, and improvement. And they might have a conversation with some finance people, their accountants, their yes. um, maybe where their development team, um, some the building managers, and then they've created the, a brief already and then they go and find an architect to fit into the brief and then we have this ridiculous procurement system where it's very vulnerable to the client just making a decision purely based on price and then the architects are kind of left in the situation of like there's a lot more that we could be offering here and but now we're in a situation where 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 we can't have a dialogue with the client because it's against the competition rules or the procurement process this is really silly and actually, there's a whole world of value, which is what you're discussing here. Yes. Yeah. But now we're just being asked to do the drawings. Um, you know, Ryan, I can only solve one problem at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the procurement process is part of that old model, right? right? Let's be honest. It's part of that. And it fits in, it dovetails in really nicely to that old model. Mm-hmm. Um, do I wish it was different? Of course I do. Mm-hmm. But um, these things take time. They take time. They take reflection. They take conversations like this. Mm-hmm. Um, they take education of clients. They take education of procurement officers. And so, I, like I said, I am I'm very aware as the years tick by that I don't have a tremendous amount of time. But with the time that we have left as designers and architects, and I like to call myself a community builder, Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, um, I have to call myself an architect because that's legally I'm, uh, I need to. But um, I think hopefully in one small way, this conversation, other conversations, um, land somewhere that someone says, hang on a second, I want to do this differently. Yeah. Because again, if we talk about, that circle of people sitting down together. I, as the architect, am not in the middle of that circle preaching to the procurement people that they Mm -hmm. need to do it differently. We all have to sit down together, right? And so I talk as much as I can about it. Um, I talk to my clients as much as I can about it. And it may not for for us. I mean, we live in a real world. These are hypotheticals. These are uh, ideals. And Mm -hmm. some of my clients, we, we land on those ideals and we move forward with them. Some of them live in a in that older model, and we have to also serve them. And so patience, <laughs> patience is important. And just being true to the values that we think we can bring as architects, as strategic partners in the built environment. 
Um, and it may not be this project, but it may be the next project sure. um, with that client. And so the long game is really part of the process. Do you, do you find yourself then advising to, um, you know, the, uh, and, and it, trying to influence regulations and government, you know, and the overall <laughs> procurement system itself? Uh, not, that's chapter two. Right. <laughs> Chapter one, chapter one is to serve as diligently as it can the people who come to us and say, we need to think about something different. Mm -hmm. Because I think about our clients as co-conspirators as well, right? So uh, they, they sign on to this and it's not, um, it's not a traditional process. Mm -hmm. And so they're learning it. We're learning together. And so they, they're really part of the puzzle um, as much as we are part of the puzzle. And they are signing up to be part of the solution. So together, we're moving these ideas. We're proving. We're, so their projects are the test grounds. And they're, mm -hmm. they're involved in that testing. They're curious about that testing. And so together with their clients, with their consultants, with the builders, mm -hmm. we are demonstrating these ideas. And then hopefully we have enough um, um, data because we, we're really, I feel, uh, demonstration and data is really important to the conversation. It's wanting to say something, but if you can't demonstrate it and if you can't prove it, then you've lost half your audience. Sure. Um, and so to be able to build up enough that we can actually start testing it, that's when we feel we can go to the regulators and say, hey, mm -hmm. we have a different way and, and here's the data, here are the, the KPIs that show how it can be, um, how it could be successful. And for you guys as a as an architectural business, do you still get involved in kind of that that kind of production side of it, producing oh, yes. drawings and Oh yes, yeah. Yes. Um less so now. Most of our clients come to us for that um strategic mm -hmm. the strategic stuff. Um I know when a lot of um a lot of people were re revisiting hybrid office and, you know, you could look at a magazine and see a pretty picture, but the hybrid office is something that uh, we advise clients to be really strategic about because mm -hmm. every operation is different and every um, group of employees and every organization has a different culture, a different function. And again, when we look at it from a strategic operational level, um, the building, the interiors, have to respond to those operational pressures and mm -hmm. those operational opportunities. And so it is, yes, we do traditional work and yes, we do. We have clients who, I mean, when you think about workplaces, you have a fixed time, you have a lease that is the ticking bomb, the ticking clock um, that you have to respond to. Yeah. And so we find ways to respond to that in an intelligent way as well. And still meet the still meet the deadlines, still meet the criteria, but I think it's important to leave the client always with something to think about that's more exciting than, you know, put some offices here and put the boardroom well, in the corner. Well, it's, it is what's so interesting about it is that you're actually kind of tapping into a lot of quite deep things about place making and community, and it's you know at the heart of it is a kind of identity conversation. Yes, absolutely, that's, that's been that's been you know perpetuated and and driven and that as an organization is massively important just in terms of how you communicate how your efficiency works what your vision is for the rest of the the organization how mm -hmm. the how effective you're going to be and what your overall goals and objectives are and i think to have architects involved in that conversation is so important because i i know you've heard me talk about this before that you know, it's so it's so often that architects get cut out of those high level strategic conversations yes. and we've got so much to offer yes i mean maybe there's a side project here where we try to find out exactly why we're cut out of that process mm -hmm. um because i think that's an important question to ask and how do we um encourage people who are you know the people who are there to um make a quick buck and I'm I'm not saying there's anything wrong. If that's your thing, that's your thing. Um, you know, you be you. Um, but uh the people who um hire those people are the ones I think that need 
to step back a minute and ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Because if you hire someone to deliver a project and you say, we need you to deliver this project with X amount of dollars and X amount of time, um, is that the right question to ask in the beginning of a project? Yeah. Um, You know, and so the people who are employing us, employing the developers, um, sorry, not not the developers, but the um, the builders and the finance people, um, they're the ones that need to ask this question. They're the ones that need to flip the script mm-hmm. in a way. Um, and so it might be interesting to find out why, what is this sort of obsession with, you know, having having the plugs in the wall and plugging it with certain people and not having this sort of um, holistic, approach where everyone sees everyone's contribution Mm -hmm. and it's a fairly open and and it's a you know you sit down I sit down in a room and and I think it's so fun it's such like beyond it being effective and you have all your KPIs and everything works really well and everyone's happy and we're singing songs together all that stuff it is so fun to be in a room and to say what's the vision for this project it is I mean, if you're not doing that, you're missing out on a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Why, from your perspective, why do you think architects, you know, if you were to hazard a guess, perhaps, why do you think architects often have been circumnavigated in this aspect? Or where was some, have we dropped the ball somewhere? Um, yes, and. I think, uh, yes, we've dropped the ball somewhere because, um, for for whatever reason we don't we don't claim our lane we don't own our lane we don't say this is the value i can bring and lean into that but at the same time the pressures of the built environment and getting things done on time on budget and all these constraints um those are really difficult things to navigate and to mm-hmm. go to let's say a developer or someone who's got a piece of land, they need to finance it. You know, some of, some of these finances cost millions of dollars a month of just, so the pressures of that, yeah. we're part of a system. Um, and as much as we'd like to be idealistic and move towards a sort of happiness model, which is what we're trying to do. Um, we are again, systems. We're living in a system that, does not value that. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, sees that as a devaluation of the property. You know, if you're spending millions of dollars a month uh, while everyone's talking about vision and, you know, all these things, if you see it from that perspective, of course, um, the architects, the model I'm talking about, um, doesn't feel like it would get you to the destination of on time and on budget. I, I guess a part of it as well, I suppose, is the, the architect is architects generally are very good at thinking big picture and long term. Yes. And a lot of what we're d- discussing here for an institution is that they get just caught up in being short sighted and yes. looking for a short a short term kind of result to be able yes. to judge success through. Absolutely. And if you think about the different clients we have, like um, the, when I, when we used to do multifamily res, which we don't do anymore, mm-hmm. um, the client is not the person living in those condo suites or the rental suites. The client is removed from the experience of that architecture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so their uh, performance metrics are going to be different than the person who actually lives in that building. Yeah. Um, we've noticed a difference between that kind of client and a client who is, say, a university client. Um, not only do they have to live in that building that you've designed for them, they have to maintain it. Mm-hmm. Um, they they have to use that building or that design as a way to recruit students and recruit uh, staff and recruit professors and and faculty. And so the the KPI, the KSI, the key strategic indicators and the key performance indicators are very different. Um, and so when you think about a client's, um, the client you have and, and what drives their involvement in a project, I think it starts to make sense. Right? Mm-hmm. It starts to become, uh, it's, you start to see that. And so what we have done is that we've sought out clients that fit 
this model of let's take a moment to address the systemic issue and how this project can serve you in the longer term mm -hmm. and, and, and help you recruit. So the building is not just a building to house, you know, uh, X amount of people per the building code. Uh, yeah. It's there to serve. It's got a, it's got a higher purpose, Yeah, you know, than shelter from the environment. Um, how does this relate to your B Corp certification? Well, the B Corp certification is sort of, as you said, um, is the indicator, is the outside indicator of what's happening inside. And so it also holds us to bear on those KPIs. So we mm -hmm. say we want to, we, by this year, we want to accomplish X, Y, and Z. These are the indicators we have. Like one of, one of our indicators is, you know, 75% of our projects will go through this um, visioning process, this sort of... Uh, multi-stakeholder, diverse ideas at the table, mm -hmm. um, community-led design impetus, um, impetus of design. Um, and so it, it holds you to account. Right. Uh, and it also is one of those things where, to use a terrible uh, analogy, if the, if you build it, they will come. If you, <laughs> meaning not buildings, <laughs> I don't mean to use it for buildings, but if you, if you build the ethos, if you yes. build, if you build the ethos around a vision you have, and for Cora, it's, we want to build happiness and inclusion in the built environment. Mm -hmm. um, the people who want that, the people who, who may not know what that looks like, but they know they want it. Um, because we all have the sense we are human beings, we're connected to each other in various ways, um, in some profound ways, even, you know, uh, we, we are a connected web of consciousness, mm -hmm. um, and you will, you will, we'll, we will find each other if we have similar values and if we're doing similar things, our clients also want happiness, which is why yeah. they find us. Right. And so, um, you build the ethos and they, and they will come. I think that's so really, that's what the, and that's what the B Corp does. It, it, right. um, it broadcasts that ethos. Yeah. I, I, I found it very interesting with the practices that I've interviewed over the past who have become B Corp certified and the, the kind of community that is emerging of organizations around the world um and how it's a kind of you know because it's no easy thing to get certified it's no it's it's no. a it's a pretty arduous i mean how long did it take you guys to, to two do? two and a bit two years and a bit right so it's, yes. that's a yes yeah, so it's a serious investment of of time and yes. and were there and were there a, a, a kind of series of things that you were failing on perhaps to begin with and then you had to up level it to hit the standards or well, I think the luckily, as as our um, as our consultant said, B Corp was built into the to the DNA of Cora from the beginning. Right. But as a small organization um, and as an emerging practice, you don't have all these things documented sure. in a way that. So in a way, B Corp was while it was rigorous, it actually forced us to codify a lot of the things that we were very casual about, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and allowed us to see how the impact of what we're doing in real numbers. So yes, B Corp is a great like indicator out there, but I think internally it really changed how we operated and how seriously we took that operation. Um, I mean, we're still, we're still a little unserious, which is great. I think. I think being a little unserious is important. We can't take ourselves too seriously, but it, mm -hmm. it really did create a format and create some rigor and discipline within the organization that I'm grateful for. And, and does it uh, allow you to be able to, you know, you, you can now go and identify other B Corp um, organizations and does it give you a, a kind of calling card or an open door or a way just to connect with another business or business leaders Absolutely. easily? Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, I, I went to my first B Corp um, retreat mm -hmm. uh, in March, I think it was. And it was, it felt like coming home. It was the most bizarre. Uh, I've been to conferences before, architecture conferences, all kinds of conferences. Yeah. And you're, you're in, yeah, you're there, there to do business. Uh, 
you meet people and the first day everyone's hugging, everyone's like talking about their values, talking about their social impact. It is an unreal and beautiful experience. I've never experienced anything like it before. And it felt a little like coming home. Um, and I'm, what I mean by that is there's always been this drive to do work this way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always been an uphill uh, climb. I've always been going against the grain to bring these values into a traditional architecture practice. Um, and even when I started Cora or founded Cora, um, I, I had to make that decision and strategically navigate through a very traditional um, and, and even to this day, male dominated uh, um, uh, and not just male dominated in um, people, but male mm -hmm. dominated in the attitudes and the culture and the practice. Uh, early in my career, even though I was a woman, I personify that maleness mm -hmm. uh, in order to be a successful architect. So that's what I mean by male dominated profession. Um, I, I just, you know, you, you, you meet people who are CEOs and of huge organizations that are B Corp and they have something different. Yeah. Um, they, they, they show up differently as a human being. Um, and I, I, it's, it's, it's an incredible experience to be part of that community because if it's, you don't feel, you feel like, because it felt alone, yeah. uh, frankly, it felt alone. Um, and luckily I'm a very stubborn person, so I kept doing it. <laughs> luckily or un unluckily. Um, and so when you show up to a place like that and see that there are other people who have really made their mark on the world mm -hmm. and, and, and established themselves, um, and redefine success, frankly, um, it becomes a real treasure to be part of that community. I, I guess the other thing that's quite amazing about it, like you're kind of uh, hinting at here, is that it's a real diverse mix of organizations and businesses. You could have yes. your Fortune 500 companies that are on Absolutely. there and yeah. meet the CEOs, and then you can have smaller mom and pop type of yep. businesses and stores yes. from every possible imaginal imaginable industry as well which yes. i think is also yes. particularly fascinating and everyone's kind yes. of um uh connected by a very ser a similar set of values and aspirations yes. of what business can be uh, useful. I, I hope it's a movement i hope it's a movement that catches on i hope it's a movement that um i mean you go i go <laughs> Even before I became a B Corp, um, I sought out, if I went to the store and I and there's a, two bars of soap and one's a B Corp and one's not a B Corp, I'll buy the B Corp, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's what I mean. It's like you, you, you find each other, you seek each other out because the value proposition mm -hmm. is the same and your success measures are more expansive. They're more nuanced mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you've taken the time, which goes back to the practice that we have. You've taken the time to stop and say, what is my value proposition? What, what is my offering to the community? What is my offering on this table we call society? Um, and so I think that that really synergized with us. And so becoming a B Corp was a no brainer. Love it. Yeah. Um Obviously, you were one of a BOA clients, and we've worked to work together in the past. What were some of the things that you were doing with us that that influenced the way that you run your business, or kind of changed the direction, perhaps? Um, implementation. <laughs> <laughs> you drill that into us <laughs> from day one. Um, I I'm a victim of. Uh, perfection is the enemy of yeah <laughs> of success um and so i think one of the things well i'll start from the top one of the things i really got out of um boa is it gave me the space and the courage to think about the vision and think about the mission mm -hmm. um in a very structured way um 
and in a very purposeful way. And I think that that foundation was really key to being comfortable with the language of vision, with the language of purpose. Um, it became really, um, I, I am very comfortable talking about our values because of that, uh, because of that uh, um, working with BOA. Um, and then there's also was the tactical stuff. It's just like uh, understanding that um, there are practical, tactical things that you have to do. So mm -hmm. yes, you have the vision and yes, you have that stuff. But unless you're doing it and implementing it in your business, it stays as an idea. Yeah. And as we know, ideas, my husband always says, ideas is, baby, ideas is not your problem. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so to, to drive the implementation of, um, of those ideas was huge for me and to be able to find structure and discipline in that was huge. Amazing. What's yeah. the rest of 2024 got planned for you? Well, we're going to do our first uh, annual retreat. I know it's a long time coming and what's in store for us to re is to really lean into our B Corp commitments mm -hmm. and to um, really drive home the impact of our social impact um, and, and, and uh, merging that with the actual numbers of the KPIs. And so being able to have that flow between the vision and the the metric, the outcome, the success factors, I think is where where we're at tactically, internally, and externally. We 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 want to um, we want to bring these ideas to the road. We want we want to really start talking to other architects, talking to educators, talking to municipalities, um, having dialogues like this, having dialogues in a bigger forum to bring to the awareness of the built environment, people who are responsible for the built environment, that we can do it differently and we can do it in a way that still holds everyone's profit margins, mm -hmm. um, uh, but basically reframe what success looks like when we think about the built environment. So that's that's the thing, that's the big picture for us is to, to really build our army of co-conspirators um, on the journey to happiness. Um, yeah. I love it. Amazing. I and mean, it's a perfect place to conclude the conversation, Michelle. Thank you so much for my, speaking. My it's always a delight to speak with you. And I'm always super inspired when I hear about what you guys are up to and your, and your vision for the built environment. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Lovely to talk to you too. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.